freedom's fight. Oh, I'm strong and free. Africa is our own motherland, fashioned with and blessed by God's good hands. Let us, all oh, her people, join as one, brothers under the sun. Oh, one strong and free, one land and one nation is our cry. Dignity and peace need Zambia sky Like a noble eagle in its flight Zambia, praise to thee O oh, one, strong and free Praise be to God Praise be, praise be Praise be bless our great nation Zambia, Zambia. Free men we stand under the flag of our land. Zambia, praise to thee, O oh, one strong and free. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we appreciate you for your love that has brought us and the nation to this far. We also would like to express our gratitude for the grace that you have conferred to our leaders to save this nation in efficiency. We also pray that, Lord, we thank you because you are God and because you never change. Father, Lord, now as we conduct this timely and significant press briefing, we ask for your love and guidance. We also ask that the Holy Spirit may guide us through the questions that they may be intentional to build and not to destroy, to mend and not to break, to unite and not to divide our nation. Father Lord, we also pray that you may be with us right from this start through to the end of this occasion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we all be seated. Uh, you are all welcome to this press briefing at State House. Like uh, the president says, normally this is at your State House. And um, may I recognize the head of state himself who will be giving our remarks this morning. Uh, the cabinet ministers who are here, uh, permanent secretaries, senior government officials, and obviously the owners of the, the function, the media. I want to mention that we are live on um, a national broadcaster and a number of other uh, TV and radio stations across the country. We are also live on a number of platforms uh, in Zambia, and um, abroad. That's on Facebook, platforms, um, Twitter, and a number of other platforms. So the order of, of events will be like this. The head of state will give his remarks. Uh, thereafter, uh, as usual, there will be questions from our media colleagues uh, in the, the usual way we do. Uh, we will give guidance when we reach that stage. So without wasting much of our time, this is not my event. This is an event for the head of state to engage with the, the public through our colleagues in the media. It's my honor and privilege now to invite the head of state to give his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, just to acknowledge once more the colleagues that are present here, the ministers, um, 
public servants, central government, local government, through the secretary to the cabinet. All of you are recognized. And I know that we also have friends like Frank Muntuvila being present. He deserves a mention because he's senior in this field. Uh, I think we must respect that um, as much as possible. And I'm also aware the media colleagues, State House colleagues, are here. This press briefing um, is a continuation of our commitment to the people who put us in office to update them. is to continue with our commitment to those that put us in office with regard to briefing them on how we, their servants, are managing their affairs, public affairs. So that's a context within which this press briefing is being held. And we will try and connect issues based on where we are coming from, very briefly, the efforts we are making to get the country right. And there's no need to spend too much time on that, but it is important to recognize that a journey has a commencement point and it must indicate where that journey is supposed to end. And for us, that journey is supposed to end at a point where we, co to co we continue growing the economy. We continue growing the economy. And I'll show you the picture of what we don't want to see under our leadership, which has been happening for the over 57, 58 years we've been independent. And that has to do with the peaks and traps lack of consistency in growth of the economy, which damages everything. People's quality of life gets affected. Provisions for those who are in need gets affected. And I'm saying this so as a nation we can share in that journey. Yes, we'll have different opinions on how to deal with a particular item, but overall, we must share as a nation in that journey towards consistent growth and providing for the weak, the sick, the old, the retired, the different abled in our society. That's the headline, but this brief will contextualize that and pick the key areas of effort and indeed where we need the public, and we always do need the public to come in many ways, criticism, positive or negative, that's fine. But we must do those things so we can get where we should take the country. That's how the countries that are now developed walked through their challenges. So, law and order. Law and order. We will continue on this trajectory. Just remind citizens that it's a prerequisite to achieving growth. It's one that must be kept intact if we want to achieve growth on a consistent basis. Plus or minus, yes, but on a consistent basis. We must maintain law and order. Yes. We started talking, taking stock of what we needed to do 2021 after August into 2022. We, we bring that period together to take stock, governance issues, law and order, knew that the debt was hustling us around. We knew that this python called the debt was crippling our neck, our ribs, and our legs, and I'm sure you've seen what we meant by now. 
essentially, we were digging the foundations for building a house or reconstructing the house. But law and order is one of those critical foundations. Fighting corruption must continue. We must continue fighting corruption, past, present, future. And we shouldn't call this any name it does not deserve. If you wish to ascribe to it, it would be unfair. But law and order means we must do it within the law. And sometimes it's a bit slow, it frustrates us, understood. But to accelerate this, a couple of measures have been made, I think you're aware, so we can say these are the issues we're doing around there. Populating the judiciary with a number of judges, and we believe the quality that is necessary to handle law and order. As you know, when we infringe the citizens, we report to police or other oversight institutions, but we end up in court. So the courts must be ready. So the courts have been given more judges, different levels, but also more resources. Numbers are there in the budget. And also, established the Economic and Financial Crimes Court, very important, so we can accelerate deliver of justice. And that includes changes that are in trend now, that matters must be handled within a defined period. Otherwise, you have an indefinite hearing of cases. That's not justice. It's delayed. Therefore, it's denied. Abolishing the death penalty is part of civility. And I must say, as we travel around the, the world, this has been well acknowledged. And we are advanced ahead of even bigger countries, more successful countries. I remember one lawmaker, I won't state the name of the country, asked me, you have surpassed us. We have been debating this in this house for years and years. I said, well, maybe you didn't want to do it. We wanted to do it. We did it. So we want to indicate that that move is beyond national boundaries. It's about humanity. The criminal defamation of the president is part of this rule of law. Remove of it to allow citizens to debate issues, hopefully maturely. That's part of it. Ending lawlessness in public places, bus stops, markets, must continue. I do, as you know, follow media of all sorts, and I do notice that there are complaints here and there. Some people believe that pronouncement was made only as an entry point for us into government. No, we believe in it. Members of the public, cadres, political party cadres, ordinary citizens, widows, should be able to trade in markets freely. No one should levy. You look at today's headlines in the newspapers. The particular party cadres used to levy citizens in the markets, additional tax, huge amounts of money. You calculate that daily, monthly, 365 days a year, it was huge amounts of money. Illegal tax. That will not be allowed from anyone. But UPND members, cadres, PF, UNIP, anyone, you are free to trade in the market. That's your constitutional right. But you will not be allowed, I repeat, to charge anyone money. And part of the reason we made changes in the police, bringing in a new team there, is to enforce the law. That's part of the rule of law. The president doesn't have to pronounce himself every now and then on such matters. We must pronounce ourselves once, 
those are, who are charged with that responsibility must implement because it's in the laws. So it goes to councils, local authorities, Minister of Local Government. Let's enforce those requirements. And the council cannot continue complaining about revenues and crying to somebody. No. We've given them the opportunity which they didn't have one year, ten months ago. They now have it. Please, let's all do our jobs. Citizens must feel free to move, to chat with anybody within the law. That's a prerequisite to the growth agenda, and you will see that shortly. Drug abuse is a concern to all of us. We need to address that, again, law enforcement in a civilized way. Support mechanisms to our drug users. It's essential. Around this call, I wish to call on families I raised this issue at the wedding of my daughter, our daughter. The families are the beginning point to inculcate values, respect for the law, hard work, but also to work against alcoholism, drug addiction. It starts in the family. Please, parents like me, let's take charge. Churches, we're calling on you. NGO, civil society, everybody. Let's work together as society's community to support our members. Every drug user has a family. They have a family they come from. They have a church they go to. They have an association sometimes they would belong to. Let's apply those platforms to help stabilize our society. I can confirm here the government is putting resources, more resources, and other efforts to improve, enhance the rehabilitation and treatment centers, including new ones. But government alone cannot do it. We all need to work together. Economy. Economy. I repeat what we've said over and over, that this is the side of the equation that will address our challenges. You don't have to be an economist or an accountant to understand that. If you have no revenue, no income in the household, you cannot spend. But the economy is as simple as that at the surface at the individual family level. It extends into institutions, into the whole country. We have to get this right. It's a must. It's a must. Let me show you what we don't want to happen under our government, which has been happening since independence. I think it's there. Can you see that? Graph, I'm not a lecturer. I know one opposition member calls me a lecturer. I'm not a lecturer. Lecturers are somewhere in the institutions of learning. But it's an illustrative point that I want to make. Part of our duty was to stabilize the macro situation. And I'll come to what we've done around there. But this is the biggest ticket, colleagues, fellow citizens. And we must all work together to resolve this ticket and avoid what has been happening. If you check that, it will show you from 1960, if we start, I believe it's 1973 there. 1973, you will see a curve where the economy and bars was going up, growth, following year down. We grew 1974, 1975, the economy declined. It goes on. We grew again, 1980, thereabout. 1982, the economy went down. 
So what you see is a flat curve there, almost the economy remaining the same up to 1991. You can't provide for the people. You can't improve lives in that manner. It's there. This is not my figures. These figures come from the Central Bank, Bank of Zambia, and the Minister of Finance. To be specific, we shared this graph as we were attracting investment in London and elsewhere last week, only last week. But the message, you will see what we're driving here. Now, come 1991, we grow in 1993, 1994, we plummet growth, plummeting it. You can go on that period up to, if I may say, 201. 201, you see the economy starts growing. Just be patient. We'll get there very quickly. Take interest. I know citizens, many citizens don't take interest in facts and numbers. You can't run an economy, a country without this. I know we like to circumvent this. It doesn't work like that. So, from 9201, we start seeing consistent growth. Consistent growth. Consistent growth up to 2010. You see that yourselves. 2011, 2012, we start declining. Please follow that graph. It's very important to the message we will deliver shortly. You see the economy starts going down again. And from 2001, we never had negative growth. Up to 2010, 2011, 2012. Then after 2012, the, declining, the decline in the growth of the economy commences. And it climaxed with negative growth for the first time since 1995. Please follow what I'm saying. Since 1995, we saw the first negative growth in 19, sorry, in 2020. There you are. You can't pay retirement benefits. I'm sure you are surprised why we were not able to pay retirement benefits in that period since 2011. I'm sure you are surprised or you are not now that I've shown you that that's why meal allowances were withdrawn from students. That's why in that period free education was withdrawn. Probably slightly earlier. I'm putting things in context. Now, what else did you see in that period? 2001 to 2011, we had cleaned the debt. The balance sheet debt came down. 2011, 2012 to 2021, the debt came back with a vengeance. We cannot save our citizens in that way. Now, come 2021, you see the economy starts growing again to where we are. The curve is going up. There's a message there. We have to run the country with the right policies. We may not like the policies, but they're the right ones. Number two, we have to provide better leadership in the country. You may not like it, but that's the truth. And I can draw your attention, 20, 1991, 92, 94, those peaks and troughs arose because 
of the change that took place to realign the economy. Different policies came into place, different leadership came into place, and growth started. 201, different leadership came in there, and growth starts going up consistently. And structural changes to the economy are made. Structural changes, adjustments, and the debt is brought down. The positive side is there for everybody to see, because in politics we like arguing without numbers. Today I thought I must talk with numbers. And hopefully the arguments will sink in why we are doing what we are doing under the new Dawn government. 2011 there's a change of government. Policies change. Consumption takes charge of investment. So that cave you can put names of leaders if you want. I will not do it for you. Do it yourselves. Put the names of leaders and you will see the pattern follows the names of leaders and the policies. And leaders is not just the president, it's the cabinet as well. It's an indictment on the whole leadership. And that's why this UPND New Dawn government is clear that we should not go back to those peaks and traps. We should now set the stage and continue with the restructuring of the economy, suppressing extravagance, Frank. That is why we are saying we don't want VXs. If you check, the extravagance comes, wrong policies come, leaderships come, children won't be in school. Simple, very simple. It's all there. Under Kaunda, ministers were driving Peugeot 504, Frank, Toyota Cressida. Today I say to my colleagues in cabinet, don't drive the VX. They think I'm denying them luxury. Now, how can you have luxury without production? I'm glad my cabinet understands that. I'm very lucky. I want to thank these ministers. But for those that feel offended, I'm sorry, the test of the pudding is in the eating. It's here. The more luxury came after 2011, the picture is there. So we must desist from extravagance. We must exist from policies that destroy growth. That's a headline message. So what are we doing as UPND? Immediately we came into office, we decided to manage the macro situation. Inflation, to stabilize it. It's painful to some people, but it's necessary pain. You want your headache to go away, you need to take the, the, the bitter pills. But we need to understand why we're doing that. Some people benefit in an inflationary environment, but the economy suffers. No question about it. Stabilizing the exchange rate. If you check the exchange rate, we lost it after 2011. I can show you the figures. I don't need to do that. We have the schedules for the media. The exchange rate was damaged from four or five quarter to a dollar from 2011 to somewhere 20 or 20 something at the change of government. Now we are working to bring it back to stabilize. But we can't do it in one month because there are measures that we need to put in place so that those measures take effect and you see stability. And I'll show you one of the measures. And you see why we are doing the things that we're doing. We're carrying the nation along. That's why we're explaining to you. Our duty is to return the country back to economic growth. There you are. 2021 election, 2022, you see the graph is very clear there. Very, very clear. The growth bottoms up. 2023, I'll explain to you one of the key measures. You think we are pulling measures from nowhere. No, no, no. They are all well thought out. But we have to work as a team, as a country. Debt restructuring. 
is one of those things, Frank, that is crippling us, that took the economy down. Debt service, the revenues available to the country is going, we're going to debt service. Until we defaulted in 2020, it's all there. So part of our duty is to resolve the debt mountain. That's why we are traveling. That's why we went to Paris to meet President Macron. He's the co-chair of the G20 debt restructuring. That's why we're engaging China. And soon, we'll be there. Process. That's why we engage the West. That's why we engage the East. That's why we engage everybody. We don't have to be caught up with isms, socialism, capitalism. It's not our business. Our business is to engage all those that will help us resolve the debt crisis, which is inherited. And as I've said before, those who talk the most are the ones who took us to the bottom. Citizens must open your eyes. We're trying to find a solution, and we know the importance of that solution to the economy so that we continue to grow and not flip-flop. Then we can provide for all. I'm sure just to remind people you are aware that China and France are the co-chairs to our debt resolution framework. Decision made by our creditors and partners jointly through an organized process called G20 framework. Now the question is that our colleagues in the opposition are trying to polarize this process by saying the new Dawn government is anti-China. Now who benefits in that polarization? The people who suffer. So let's take politics out of such issues and work as a nation towards debt resolution because it's beneficial to the economy and to keeping our children in school, including those from the poor families. That's it. That's it. We are confident. We've done so much work on our part as Zambia. We met our benchmarks, all of them without exception. I want to thank our team, broader team, all of them, because we work as a team, for having met our part of the bargain. Now it's an indictment on our colleagues under the framework to resolve this matter so we can unlock this python from our necks, ribs, and legs. This is the issue. We must stand together as a nation on this monster called debt. We need to do that. We, we don't have a choice. We expect that the next official creditor committee will find closure. And part of my discussions with President Macron was to ask him and his partners, as we've done with President Xi Jinping of China, that meetings of the official creditor committee must not be postponed unnecessarily. And when they meet next, we must find closure. And I've asked the Minister of Finance and his team to follow through very closely, Central Bank very closely. And I'm there 24-7, Minister of Finance will tell you that any time in the, in the night is a matter to be resolved, we do it. I remember two weeks ago or so, Minister of Finance or three weeks ago, there was to be a delay in one of the technical committee meetings. One of the country members of that committee were on holiday in their country. And the minister and I talked to each other and said, give me a moment. And I spoke to the president of that country and made those people available to work during a holiday. That's our job. It's what we were elected to do. Because we know the importance of this issue. And I thank that president and his team members for being available for Zambia. That's the value, Frank, of re-establishing bilateral and multilateral relations. Zambia is now back in the League of Nations 
as a decent member, not as a Cinderella member. That's a fact. Goodwill doesn't come from chance. No. You cultivate it. That's why we are cultivating it. Colleagues, because we need to resolve the debt python, mountain, overhang. What else are we pushing on? Working with the private sector is very important. Public sector jobs are important, growth from there is important, but the private sector. That's why the private public dialogue forum was established. It was not a thumb suck, no. It was to bring the public and private sector together to face the economic challenges. So we established that. I guess some of the colleagues are here from that platform. I'm drawing the importance of why that was brought in place. So that it's no longer them against us. It's us working together. And so part of our duty now, 2023, is to eliminate bottlenecks to growth. Deliberate. Having dealt reasonably with macro stability, we now need to open the growth side, the investment side of the economy, 2023. That's why we've dedicated it to removing stumbling blocks to economic growth. So we can have that graph going up. Of course, when we have a calamity, a drought or something else, it may be affected, but overall, the graph should be going up. I have my personal ambition myself, my performance indicator around there. It's an ambitious one. But so should ministers have in their ministries to contribute to that. So should cabinet office, so should be private sector, so should be ZNBC and media, because you play a part. So we noticed that we were delaying a lot in implementing what we've agreed. And we set up, the president set up the presidential delivery unit so we can walk through the things, the measures that are necessary to grow the economy. The president is only one human being. Cabinet minister is only one in your ministry. You need the permanent secretaries to work with you, directors to work with you. So does the president, so that we can hone in on unlocking those bottlenecks, those rigidities. Zema is one of my beloved examples not to take 18 months to assess an investment project, but to take a shorter period. I don't know your target minister of green economy. I'm sure you have a target. What's your target? 20 days. 20 days. From 18 months, when we came in in 2021, we found that it was taking 18 months to turn around an application for an investment through Zema. Then you take it to warmer. Water. What was it and what's your target, sir? No, you can speak seated. It's not a. Where did you find it? One year, two years. So 18 months with Zema, the project goes to Wama, another one year, two years. How can you grow the economy? Because it means the investments won't come in. I'm putting things in context. So there's a shared vision. The Minister of Green Economy has to do his part. The Minister of Water has to do his part. So we can deal with that issue and provide for our people. That's a connection. So the President has his own obligations, and that's why he has set up the Presidential Delivery Unit, to make sure things are, are done. It's not to disturb the ministers. I'm hearing what the media is saying. through. The media, I must say, what the opposition is saying, that the president is micromanaging ministers. What I've just shown you here is not micromanaging any minister. It's working together to deliver for the people. Epela. Kwamana Mudala. Chimbitwina. That's the issue. That's the difference. That's why you saw, you see that cave going down, because that was absent. Here to talk about that is taboo. But to talk about why Jews were being killed 
by a government, and that we must never do it again, it's okay. But to talk about what we did wrong, so we can do it right now, is wrong. Where's the logic there? Kiss come on. There's no logic there. It's teamwork. Each one has a role to play. Eco economic diplomacy, fellow citizens, is working. It's working. How do I know it's working? Do you have this graph? Quickly, quickly, quickly. I don't want others to call me a lecturer. I'm not a lecturer. I may do that after I retire from politics. We have set a clear agenda as we interact with the community of citizens here and the community in other countries. Our focus is to grow the economy so we can take care of the social sectors. So when we travel, we have an agenda. When ministers travel, they are fitting in that agenda. So is the civil service, public, central, local, parastatos. We are now working on bringing parastatos in line with this agenda. So just to assure citizens that as we travel, we are focusing on mobilizing investment, improving relations, mobilizing investment. Because under the G20 franc, to vote for the Zambia's debt relief, you need countries that sit there. So we lobby those countries so they can approve our programs. Not their programs, our programs. Don't forget we know we know. Because what we're implementing is not someone's program. We're not stooges of anybody, but for our people. That we are happy to do. So just to compare, we come in 2021 towards the end. We do need investment. Foreign direct investment is part of it because domestic savings are not sufficient to grow the economy. 2021, the total pledges for direct investment, foreign direct investment, as part of domestic investment combined together, let me put it this way. We need domestic investment, but it has its place. But to grow the economy quicker, consistently, we need foreign investment. That's how countries develop. We only managed to attract pledges 3.24 billion, the whole of 2021. So from January 2021 into the election, August after the election, if you drill that number, you will see a good portion of it came after the election into December. 3.24 billion. 2022, we have the full year now, we took that almost $7 billion. Economic diplomas is at work. First quarter of 2023, there is your interest. We have taken it to $8.34 billion in three months only. First quarter means, no, no, I'm lying. Huh? No, I'm right. So it means January, February, March, $8.34 billion. That's what we're doing. That's what we're spending time on. Our job now is to convert those pledges into actual investments. And that is beginning to work. So when you see First Quantum putting in $1.3 billion, that's where it's coming from. Those are the efforts. When you see capital fertilizers bringing in $600 million, to produce top dressing fertilizer. That's the connection. That's where it's coming from. I've made a point there. Let's move on.
when we achieve growth in the economy, jobs will come. And we're looking for more private sector jobs. That's the story. That's how it works. Cost of living. We are aware that as we are addressing the economic restructuring, which we need support of everybody, we need to attend to the cost of living. We need to assist citizens pass through this restructuring process. Colleagues, yes, we know the global cost of living has gone up. We are aware of that. And as a country interconnected with others, we know that that will affect us as well. It is affecting us. Cost of fertilizer, cost of, if you like, petroleum, imported inflation. So these are issues we're dealing with. But we have taken a decision that we will support our citizens to walk through this transition as they will later enjoy the benefits of growth, consistent growth. As Indonesia is doing, as Vietnam is doing, as Botswana is doing, as many other countries are doing, we have our duty to carry citizens along. How are we doing it? That's why we came up with a decision to provide free education so that every child goes to school. We need the skills, very important, but we also support the families who cannot afford. Does this measure make sense? Yes. How do we know? Classrooms are full now. So it means children were not in school. So this is part of our measure to alleviate citizens from the pain that they have to go through. With an increase in classroom index, we now have to spend money to build schools, more classroom space, teachers' houses, water and sanitation. That is to support families to keep their children in school as we transit, restructure the economy. Very important. You may not see or understand these graphs, but you will understand free education at least. It affects every family. And every family is affected positively by free education. If you have money, take your children to the private schools. That's fine. But those who don't have money, the children will still go to school. Increase social cash transfer. That's part of the Minister of Local, sorry, Minister of Community Development's obligation. We've not just increased the, the quantums. She will tell you, Madam, quickly, where did you inherit this from? 150. Category of uh, beneficiary, one class was 150. Another class was what? 100. Where are we today? 300, one category, 800, another category. That you can feel. It's part of our deliberate decision to carry citizens along. I guess it's the older citizens, it's those that live with disabilities, it's, those, it's the women-headed households of a certain type, it's also other categories. Our duty now is to ensure that every citizen who qualifies benefits. Before, if you belong to UPND, you never got registered for social cash transfer. Forget. Now we're working with the constituencies. You can talk to her after the press briefing. Working with words to make sure that citizens who qualify come through, irrespective of the political party that they, they support, because they're citizens of Zambia. In addition to free education, we have increased student bursaries at college level. For free education up to grade 12. Student bursaries to support children in colleges, our own children. We said it, we've also done it, that we will provide meal allowances. I'm sure you have seen the happiness across the country with your own cousins and nephews having meal allowances reintroduced. You saw my visit to Copperfield University, you saw my visit to, to <laughs> University of Zambia. 
Ask yourself a question. How many sitting presidents have gone to the Cobra Belt University and interacted freely with students with happiness? Throw your memory lane back. How many sitting presidents have done that? How many sitting presidents have gone to an investor I went to where we were hostile to leaders? And we didn't want them around because if the dining hall didn't have chicken, we complained. But there was no chicken, there was no dining hall anymore. It was taken away. Leadership. But we reintroduced meal allowance. And you saw the students reacting. It's deliberate, citizens. How can a child go to class on an empty stomach? Do you expect them to pass? That's why we've had to find the money in the difficult circumstances. Now other universities are saying, HH, when are you coming to Mulungushi University? When are you coming to Chalimbana? When are you coming to Levi Mwanawas? To Leisa. Leisa. But on a more serious note, this is what your government is doing so that even the child from a poor family can go through university. And you heard my message then that we don't want sugar daddies anymore in these colleges and universities. Because we are disturbing our children. But our children had no choice. Now we have taken away the sugar daddies. S serious. Yes, and imports, of course. <laughs> Let our children focus on school. This is their government they elected as we restructure the economy. Food security packs, part of it, I can go on. Health. We have challenges in here. We acknowledge. We need to continue to improve drugs flow, availability of medical staff to serve patients. We need to continue doing that. We need to nip in the hemorrhaging of drugs, pilferage, from public drug stores into private clinics and pharmacies. The job we have to do, we acknowledge that. And we like to work together with the community, because the community know who is siphoning drugs from the hospitals. Check the budget. One of the ministries that has received more money up basically exponentially more money is health. So we can buy drugs, so we can buy equipment, cancer, everything. So we can provide more service. That's why we employed more medical staff, 10,000 plus, deliberate measures to assist improve service delivery in this sector. So community. Please send a note when you see when you see someone taking drugs that belong to the people and take them into a private pharmacy, talk. Say something. Because those are your drugs. Those are your drugs. Digital platforms, government services must go on digital platforms to improve efficiency, delivery of licenses, responding to citizens. Ministry of Lands is now available 24-7 on ZAM portal. We want more government services. Digital ID, so that the same person who is getting FISIP money does not get other facilities. I didn't even talk about FISIP here. So we should work even quicker. Internet access to schools. We talked about it some time back. And today, as we sit, I think a provisional license has been given to Elon Musk's company. What is it called? 
Starling, am I right? They are doing trial runs now. We talked about it, it's happening. That's a technical trial run. And when we're through with this, plus other measures, we should have internet to all our children in schools, agriculture centers, health centers. Then we can do more digital business, which is efficient. It will help us improve revenue collection for government. Colleagues, mining is something we are all keen to see. Difficult situation we inherited, took down part of that decline in growth came from the mining sector. Now we need to ramp it up. Complex legal issues we found ourselves in, but we are disentangling this. We've taken a decision. We will not do business in courts, in mining or in other sectors. We lose money there. Let's do business in the boardrooms. So in disentangling these protracted legal issues, we have lost ground on concluding Mopani and KCM. We take admission of that. But we continue to work hard. We continue to work hard to close those transactions because they're essential to our economy, to colleagues on the Copperbell, to suppliers of goods and services. Very important. Let me say something about CDF. You know the numbers, where we found it, where we've taken it. Deliberate, again, to enforce decentralization. And we are now delivering CDF in installments, of course, as planned to all the 156 constituencies, same time, equitably. No segregation at all. It was never like that before. If you are UPND constituents, you never got a money. Or in five years, you got the 1.6 million in one shot only. Today, every and any constituent gets a money. But also, local procurement issues are important to keep the money in the constituencies. Removing rigidities around the CDF, the law, Minister of Local Government, have we concluded that? So the law has been amended. Purchasing Frank. Buying procedures have been amended to allow for quicker processes and decisions that were being taken by the Minister of Local Government are now being taken, a good number of them, by constituencies themselves. That was the design. So you should see a pickup of CDF utilization and consumption of that money. Let me replace that word. Investment of that money in the constituencies, or the 156 constituencies. Deliberate to trigger economic activity at the local level. Never done before. First time since 1964 that you invest the money, so much money, but spend it in the local economy, in the constituents, unless there's no capacity. But we build capacity. How do I know that we're building capacity, Frank? We used to import desks. Under our new arrangement, desks will never be imported. Now, all of a sudden, we see that we have capacity. Desks are being made everywhere. Beautiful, isn't it? But someone will say nothing is happening. I read myself. as Nothing is happening. Honestly, can you acknowledge that desks are being made by our own young people who are also trained through CDF? Can't you see that? Can't you see that we have saved a lot of money? We're using local wood. We are value adding. Can't you see that? You mean our eyes work for different reasons? Or they see different things? If you tell me that, I will agree with you. Honestly speaking, desks are being made everywhere. And no child should sit on the floor, as we said, by a certain time, period of time. The money is there, like never before. Desks were bought centrally from Lusaka by the Glattons in Lusaka, and they imported so that they can get something. We've taken out that excess fat, and you should see growth in the local economies. The story of CDF is a fantastic one. Let's share in it. Let's support each other. You see a flaw, raise your hand. We should address that flaw. 
agriculture. I talked about it last time, that we had challenges in input distribution. But this year, the inputs will be distributed on time. Minister of Agriculture is here. There will be no excuse. Procurement processes are already in train. We are buying all the compound D fertilizer from those who add value in the economy here. The decision we take in order to address, if you can go back to that uh, chart, in order to address growth, we have to allow decisions that we buy from those that create value here. So all the compound D, at least under FISIP, CASIP, if I may call it, Expanded Agriculture Support Program, will be bought from value added here. Here in the economy, not another economy here, more jobs, more opportunities for suppliers of goods and services. Then you will see an, an effect on that. You see agriculture beginning to contribute to growth. Deliberate. So minister is here. We speak quite often. We are saying, let's now also procure top dressing from here as much as possible. And hence, you saw me officiating at the opening of the top dressing fertilizer plant with an investment of $600 million. Again, back to eco economic diplomacy and our policies. That's now, Frank, realizing the pledge from a pledge to an actual investment. I saw the plant myself. You're all free to go there. We don't have to own that plant as individuals, but it will add value to the economy. Citizens' economic empowerment. We have noticed the mill mill issue created a challenge which is very unnecessary. You move maize grown in Chavuma to Solwezi for milling. And then after milling in Solwezi, you move it back to Chavuma for consumption. Some of you heard that leaked audio. The remedies on that are taking a different tail, a different line of action. But the message I'm delivering that, that's what I was saying there. So we have now asked CEC and the SME, the minister is here, to create capacity to mill at a point of production so that we reduce the cost again you see an impact there of producing here and moving to Chipata or the other way around. Producing in Chipata, moving the mill mill here in Lusaka, then when you want to make mill mill, you move the, mil, the maize back into Chipata. Silly, isn't it? But this is how inefficient the economy has been. So we want to clean up that by saying to CEC, allocate some of the money that you have to creating milling capacity in the local areas so that demand is localized and supported locally and reduce costs. Simple. It's not a theory, Frank. No. You will see an impact on that soon. And then we can deal with the national demand in a different way. And the demand from neighbors. Discussion for another day, not for today. The full price of maize has been announced, I think two days ago. Received mixed feelings, mixed reactions. Let me tell you one simple point you should look at. We have analyzed the value chain of maize production. And we have taken a deliberate decision that in that value chain from growing maize to traders, number two, to millers, into the shop, the farmer is getting a raw deal. People who are trading are making more money than the people who are growing the maize. So what do you do? You use market arrangements. You increase the price at the producer level to encourage them to receive more money. And then they will increase the hectares. They will improve, obviously, productivity. And overall production will go up. Simple. This is not a lecture. This is real life business. That's how it works. That is why we've increased the price by 100 kwacha, from 180 to 280. 
you will see a reciprocal change and you will see into the season, of course, because the knowledge is that if this season the price is 280, then next year you can't go below 280, isn't it? So it means there's a motivation to grow more. Frank, I'm asking people seated here and the country overall who have small holdings and you already have a bow, you have 10 acres, you're using it as resident. Please grow something on the extra eight acres there. Grow something. And the Minister of Agriculture will tell you that we are looking for a facility to support anyone away from FISIP. The next window is anyone, including you, Frank. Frank. You already have bowels. You can irrigate one acre and we'll give you support, encouragement to do that. With this price, it should be attractive to do that. But growth is what we're looking for as well, including food security. We are working on lowering the cost of money. Zambian entrepreneurs are paying too much money. Africa is paying too much money for the similar projects that are done in Asia, in Europe. We Africans pay more. We are saying no to it. Part of my meeting with President Macron is he's hosting a meeting next month to look at the global financial systems. And we on the continent, some of us as presidents, six, seven of us have been selected to work on pushing down the cost of money for Africa, the interest rates for Africa. And we drive a hard bargain. I started by asking President Macron, who will be chairing that meeting of the reform of the international financial system that this is what we are asking as Africa. We're not begging. We are asking for what is right. How do you assess us against the business in Asia when the Asian business pays 5% interest? We pay 11%. When the European business, similar business, pays 2%, we pay 11%. Then you claim that you are better businessmen than us. No. Can we be fair? And you should expect in the years ahead a lowering of the cost of money for the African continent and Zambia. That's why we're traveling. And you see working its way through into growth. But we are also talking to the local financial institutions here. You look at the profitability of the banks. Frank, I'm abusing you. You see the banks here make more money than anybody else. Part of it lies in the cost of money they are lending to us. I have a sit-down meeting with them. And they're all good friends. Luckily, they're ladies eh? who run the biggest banks. I have a sit-down with them. We must lower the cost of money, make the money available, so that a small miller in Chavuma can borrow at a fair price, mill the maize in, grown in Chavuma, and feed the Chavuma demand, and you cut your cost. That's our message. I know Zambians want to hear emotional, political messages. This is it. This is the business of governing a country. Then you see free education from there. Then you see social cash transfer from there. Irrigation, Minister of Agriculture knows. Climate change means we must irrigate more. We must water harvest, dams, so we can irrigate, improve productivity and production. You will see more support, even in the budget coming. But we're working hard to see when we close the debt restructuring, the release of revenues that was going to debt service, some of it, this year, we want to take it into agriculture, more money into agriculture. But we also want to look at you so that you can produce, not just feasible. and commercial farmers. Zangena season. Zangena season. This year, Frank, you are my sounding board. This year, 2023, you will see Zambians, individuals, households, 
receiving more access to government resources than ever before since independence this year and going forward. Through the CEC, through CDF, social cash transfer, NAPSA partial payment. NAPSA partial payment. It's deliberate. We said it in opposition. It's not abracadabra. We argued our point, and we have delivered. It's all a combination of these measures. It's not one measure. It's a combination. Already money is there. The doomsayers say, no, Agunamal. Ah, look, my friend, the numbers were crunched before the policy was put in place. And also the fund size and liquidity side were dealt with. Now you issue a statement to the public, scaring the public to say, Ndala Mazasira. There's planning to these things. There's no pension fund that keeps every asset in cash. There are different portfolios of cash. When you need, sorry, assets. When you need the cash, you then do what is necessary. Because in those categories, the assets sit, you earn revenue, not consumption. We are also clear to NAPSA that they, can, they should stop investing people's money in wrong areas, as was happening for years and years. But 20% partial withdrawal, Zangen. It is not a dream. It's there. My advice, our advice to the citizens, when you access that money, please invest in revenue generation. Build a small house so that you come out of renting. Then you save money. That's my advice. We all start from there. Frank, my first house, my peers were laughing at me. Was in Kalingaling. That's what I could afford after I invest. But my friends were laughing at me. I said, but you, you are laughing at me. You have nothing yourself. At least me, I have something in Kalingaling. <laughs> Can you take a house? Doesn't matter where it is. It's your house. Young people, please invest in the correct things first. Don't invest in a BMW before you have a two-bedroom house. Get your house first. Tamper your appetite for consumption. Then the country will be better because we ask for things that are not necessary, create pressures on ourselves on, and on the government and on the family. That's my advice. What else, Frank? Under the Zangena season. Our men and women in uniform serving in the UN peace missions, we have now implemented full payment of their allowances. It's in place now. Ask your neighbor, he'll tell you that. Your nephew, your cousin. And at this point, Frank, I want to congratulate our general who has been appointed as the commander for the UN Central African Forces. Zambian is now the commander. It doesn't come by chance. It's not abracadabra. It's underground work. It's the meetings we're having. And we want to thank the UN system for recognizing our talent in our men and women in uniform. We thank them dearly. But it's concerted effort. And we want to encourage our general Work hard when you are there. Represent the citizens so that other soldiers, other policemen, other ZAF officials can also be elevated. Deliver, make us proud. That's what we are as a country, especially when we work together. Colleagues, what we are talking about is legitimate resources to citizens, legitimate, not resources that were going to a type of cadres in a political party not long ago. Only those were get, getting something. Now it's broad, it's all citizens. 
deliberate. Tantamen is not the answer. No, this is the answer. As we restructure the economy, we also alleviate the pain on citizens, legally, legitimately. That's the answer. In a fair way, equitable manner. At this point, colleagues, I wish to pose a question to my colleagues in the opposition who have a genuine role to play in a country. Let me pose a question to you. And through you, the journalists, pose this question to them. We ask our colleagues in the opposition to provide alternatives to these policies that we have shown today. Provide viable alternatives, not insults. We follow what you say. We follow all your insults, but we choose not to answer you because we are focused on the work at hand. Tell us your alternative viable policies to our policies. That's what we used to do ourselves. We even, we even used to do alternative budgets. People forget. Tell us your alternatives. Not insults, not abuse, not falsehoods. If you tell a lie, and you are abrogating a law, you get arrested, then you say, no, the opposition are being arrested. No, it's rule of law, remember? It's rule of law. Tell us your alternatives. What is your alternative to free education? To lay pusha. What is your alternative to free education? You have seen the impact of free education. Children who are out of school, even mothers who are 50 years old now, I have gone back to school. So tell us your alternative to educating the citizens, to also helping families who come from poor backgrounds. Tell us how you would have educated a fellow like me from the village. Is it you are saying that only your children should go to school? Tell us. What is your alternative? What is your alternative to meal allowances? You will withdraw the meal allowances. What is your alternative? So we, you want to come back and withdraw them? Well, you must tell that to the students. Tell the students that. Tell a child who was out of school and now is in school that you will be out of school soon. Go and tell the mother, a widow, a single mother. Go and tell them that. Tell them, let's hear you. Tell the men and women in uniform that when you come, you withdraw the full payment of their UN allowances. Tell them. They are there in the barracks. Tell them. Tell the people of Zambia that when you come back, you cancel a 20% NAPSA partial withdrawal. Tell them. <laughs> Honestly speaking. Tell marketeers that when you come, you are going to withdraw the market booster loan. Tell them. And have a conversation with them. Tell those who are surviving on social cash transfer that you reduce the amounts which have increased. See what conversation you will have with them. Let's see. Tell them that you take back constituents development fund to 1.6 million kwacha per constituent per year. Because I've heard them saying, how can you give so much money to a constituent? So tell them that you are going to roll back decentralization, which we pushed. Tell them. Tell the citizens. Tell the citizens that your solution to the debt mountain. Tell your, your citizens why you took the economy to minus 2.8%. It is there in 2020. Why did the economy go down? Remember, we said we don't want these things. We want continuous care. Yes, a bit of a dip because of circumstances, but overall growth. So tell the citizens.
tell the citizens that you want to go back to 2015, 2016, where the economy was damaged, where people were sleeping in their homes and the, the pillow was cash. Yes, tell the citizens. Tell the citizens that it's good to borrow and create a debt mountain. Tell the citizens. Yes, tell citizens that cadres will be back in Soweto market and intercity. Commanders will be back and more blood will be in the market. Tell the citizens. Tell them. Tell them Kamugodi will return. Tell them that we will not be allowed to go to church as was in Chingola and live bullets will be fired. Tell the citizens that live bullets are coming again. Let me be clear here. We respect any and all advice, positive or negative. We respect, because that's a right of citizens. We may not agree with each other on how to get the economy going. So you are free to give your views. Yes, thank you. But the economy must grow. But certainly, your alternative damage the economy. So tell us your new ideas, because the ideas that were there damage the country. So we respect any and all advice. But I must also say, equally, equally, it is true that mutual respect, no malice, facts, and not lies, none abuse of one another is a hallmark of professionalism and maturity in a society. The point is that you can say what you wish, say it factually, not maliciously, don't tell lies, maintain professionalism, you can argue hotly as long as mutual respect remains, that's fine. But when you start insulting colleagues every day, based on falsehoods, you are veering in a wrong direction. That's my message to the country. And I want to thank the people of Zambia for allowing us to work with them to help reconstruct their country so we can take care of society together in different ways. God bless you. God bless Zambia. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, thanks for that elaborate presentation. I'm sure the nation have listened. I'm sure also our colleagues in the media have been following. Now, uh, just to announce that to our colleagues in the media, we shall give you a much more detailed uh, media pack in soft copy um, coming from the various ministries and government departments uh, to give more context to what the president has uh, presented here. And uh, obviously, <coughs> for additional information, our ministers are there, available to give you much more uh, uh, information coming from their departments and what they are doing in those activities. Um, how we proceed now is uh, one of those interesting sessions, which is a question and answer sessions. I propose we go uh, maybe three questions at a, at a, at a go. Um, three questions, then the head of state will respond. And please, let's, sit, let's stick to 
what has been presented. Now, I know myself coming from the media background, there is this uh, thing we try to do, uh, try and be smart by coming and say, okay, I'm, I have one question, and then you try and weave your way towards the second question. Um, we know those things. We will just stick to one question, a person. Yeah, so many hands already. I think let me be a bit biased by starting with two ladies. No, three ladies, actually. I can see three. Well, let me see. Um, I can see that one there. Please come over. Um, is, is Mukosha? Mukosha, yes, come. And what's the name? There is no mobile microphone. No, there is no mobile microphone. Then you have? Okay, you, you can come. You can come. So the three ladies, pl come, please come. I think so. Please come. Uh, you obviously, your name and where you are coming from. Good morning, Mr. President. Um, thank you for this opportunity. My question to you is on the health sector today. You mentioned it briefly in your presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry. My name is Mukosha Funga Jenga, and I'm representing News Diggers. And my question to you today is on the health sector. You mentioned it briefly in your presentation, and you did acknowledge that there are some challenges there. And I will start firstly by commending you because after assuming office, you did um, employ about 12,000 health workers. I can't even imagine what the situation was like before those were employed. But then now, the problem that remains is that there's um, lack of equipment in our hospitals. And people are dying in queues, even for a simple scan like an ultrasound scan. People are, are dying because there's no proper equipment to treat people at the cancer diseases hospital. So when are you going to give these uh, health workers that you hired the essential tools that they need to carry out their duties? Because there's a lot of misery, people are dying unnecessarily, and it's leaving uh, a lot of families depressed because they know for sure that not enough was done to save their loved ones. And maybe also, if I can briefly just sneak this in, um, I would just like to mention that we... Okay. 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 Good morning, Mr. President. My name is Prisca Lomingo from Millennium Radio and TV. First of all, it is commendable that government is offering an enticing price to the farmers when it comes to maize. But Your Excellency, yesterday, the Food Reserve Agency also announced to say they will not be buying soya beans from the farmers. What is it that government is, how is government going to help the farmers who have invested so much into soya beans farming, considering that they consider FRA as a bigger market, cause the private sector exploit them? What is that, how are you going to help the farmers? Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Virginia Chilongo from Movie TV. Mr. President, there is a growing concern among members of the public that you tend to speak a lot of rhetoric. An example is that since taking office, you have visited the Copper Belt province on multiple occasions, addressed various sections such as miners, truck drivers, uh, crossing into the DRC. However, the plight remains the same. You have also spoken about the cost of living, non-availability of essential drugs in health centers, and addressing bureaucracy for citizens to have easier access to government or public services. But citizens who com uh, continue to complain that you merely speak without action. My question to you, Mr. President, is that how do you respond to such assertions? I thank you. Okay, thanks. Mr. President, you can take these three for now. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. To the three ladies, health sector equipment lacking cancer diseases. I think I touched on that. So we are in agreement. Um, the issue, remember, I also said that uh, Ministry of Health has received a lot more money than ever before. Our job now is to make sure that we prioritize that money, buy the equipment for the different requirements. Some of the equipment re requires repair, just repair. 
I think the issue is that we are together. In fact, I singled out the ministry myself. So we agreed. There's no issue, I think, is to expedite, to resolve those issues, um, to help improve service delivery. I also talked about the pilferage going on there, and uh, citizens, when actions are taken, people are removed, because it's a cousin of yours, don't complain. The idea is to improve service delivery. There's no cousinship there. There is no anchor there. What is there is to improve service, health service delivery to the people of Zambia. But you are the same people, when you see changes are made, then you start running social media stories that people are being victimized. There's no victimization there. Uh, if you call it victimization, we shall victimize more people in order to improve service delivery to the people of Zambia. I don't call it victimization, but if you call it victimization, if what requires to be done it means removing people, so don't complain when that is done because you know the person who has been removed. This is not the answer to the question. It's the answer to the question from the questioner for the people of Zambia. So Funga is not directed at you. you you're just a messenger uh, of what people are saying. So we agreed there. So we have to do a, a bit more. And I think sometimes we have to be a little bit stiffer. But you should see some changes there. It, 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 it's, <laughs> this is a build up of a problem of a long time. You know in the previous government there were lots of issues in health, you know, expired drugs, health became a, a, a money spinner, became a money laundering you know, ministry. So what we haven't done is a wholesale removal of people. I know some of UPND members are complaining a lot, but we also are aware that we are responsible to the citizens. And that's why we're singling out, slowly but sure, but we can pick speed, I agree with you. And we should speak speed, because people need uh, delivery of services. I'm totally agree. We are also trying to work, we're not trying, we're working on increased production of drugs, for example, locally. Again, in our quest for value addition, it's very important. So, but uh, we get your message loud and clear. We are aligned there, completely aligned. Um, maize price has gone up, soya beans, um, FRA is not buying. And the consequence is that uh, the growers will be left to what you call uh, sabotage from private buyers. I, I did indicate earlier that one of our jobs is to work with the private sector because government alone cannot buy all the maize. Even when you are saying maize is okay, government will not buy all the maize. Please understand that. I think the projection they've given is half a million tons. That's what I saw in the FRA message. So it means there are other buyers and who are private sector. So private sector and government must work together as one. So it's a package. So is the soya beans. Most of the handlers, the processors of soya beans are private sector. It's not government. I think the FRA is trying by all means to focus on strategic you know, crop for food security. Yes, soya beans is important, but we believe that in our co conversations with the private sector, public-private dialogue platform, we can deal with the decency in the marketing arrangements, in the pricing, in the manner that um, we are dealing with, uh, with maize. But soya beans is important. It's a commercial crop to some extent as well. Lots of uh, processing and uh, stock feed, of course, human consumption. So, but it's not to say we are neglecting that. But imagine if FRA was buying everything, including cassava, including um, groundnuts, including um, millet, including tomatoes, including mangoes, what would FRA become? Let us allow the private sector to do its part, as government does its part. But together, we should address growth of production, improved producer prices to encourage more production, and the story goes on. But we also want processing. Who is processing raw production of our food, even millimeter? Who is the key miller? It's not the government. Government does national service, yes. But the big millers are all private. But we have to work with each other. 
I think that's the message. I, I touched on it earlier. Speak rhetoric. I can connect what you are saying to what is being written on certain platforms. I can draw a particular connection. But that's okay. That is fine. What I've demonstrated to you today is not rhetoric there. NAPSA 20% is not rhetoric. Madam, honestly, my dear sister, uh, oh, Wenkashiani, that's not rhetoric, but it's what you read on social media from certain media, is that nothing is going on in this country. The country is worse than it before the election. But that, that chart there tells you you are lying. Whoever is arguing on that basis, the test of the pudding is in the eating. There is a pudding there. Numbers don't lie. If we were doing rhetoric, that curve would have not gone up. Within one year, eight months in office. It's actually dramatic. If you look at where we found the economy, what we've done in one year, eight months, is dramatic. But I'm the first one to say we can do more. And we should do more. So NAPSA is not rhetoric, madam. Social cash transfer is not a rhetoric. I, today I decided to run through specifics so that I could have preempted the question of rhetoric because I knew it was coming. My sixth sense told me it was coming. So I said, let me address it before it, come, it comes. That GDP growth you are seeing, I think 4.8 from minus 2.8. There it is. There. 2020 went down to minus 2.8. Maybe that's where the rhetoric was. See where the growth was in 2011. Hmm? Check where the growth was in 2011. 2010 is above 6%. Then the rhetoric comes, and the people writing rhetoric are the ones who took the economy down. They are the ones. So, you know, sometimes, colleagues, as citizens, we must be fair to each other. We may not like some people, like myself. I'm aware I'm the most exercised individual in this country. I was called a monster. That when I come, and I used to say, but where will I sell your country and my country? I haven't sold the country. What I've tried to do together with the team, we, as New Dawn and yourselves, is to work together to reconstruct the economy. Is it here, Makai? Is it here? Write it, is it here? It's not speculation, is it here? There's no rhetoric there to work to achieve a debt restructuring in the manner we are working. It's a difficult thing, I admit, but we are equal to a task. We're pulling all our stops as a team. Lobbying, doing what we can inside, pulling all the stops. That's not rhetoric, my sister. Getting the IMF program, IMF to support us in our request as our member. IMF is our institution. The colleagues that were there by 2019, they realized they were losing things. They were doing wrong things. They went to IMF two or three times. IMF said, no, you have no capacity to manage a program. We come six months down the road. We met all the benchmarks. That's not rhetoric. It doesn't come from rhetoric. It comes from hard work, ingenious work, deliberate work. You may not like us. That's OK. We, we accept that. It is not a black cat that you want in the house, if you have mice. You want a cat that catches the mice, whether it's black or it's white or yellow, whether it's orange. That's the cat you want. The cat that was there couldn't catch the mice. Check. It was, <laughs> it was green. It's not me. But honestly speaking, on a light moment, my my young journalists, this is the analysis. Today I did it deliberate. 
so that there's no confusion in analyzing what this press conference is all about. And we'll give you handouts. They're here. You analyze yourself, go to your experts, consult even the opposition. We have laid it bare. Consult the opposition. Ask them how much investment did they raise in 10 years' time. If they raised the investments enough in 10 years' time, plus the money they borrowed, the balance sheet should have been showing assets. Assets you see it in the GDP growth. But now, Pimbi, nothing. There is nothing there. It was consumption throughout. Yes, there was tantamen, but that tantamen money destroyed the economy. Because it was money contracts were given to people. They never delivered the roads. And that's why we canceled the Lusaka and Dollar Road. Because it was going to lead into a further dip in the economy. As the FTJ University contract did. As the many road contractors did. This is the restructuring I was talking about. Please, fellow citizens, go for the mice that catches the, the cat that catches the mice. That's what you need. You may not like its color, but that's what you need. Pragmatism means just that, and nothing else. It doesn't matter whether one is your relative, your cousin, your nephew, they've damaged the economy. They've damaged the economy. That's why our GDP dropped from 28 billion to 20, 19 billion. There it is for you. It's there. So there's no rhetoric here. The maize price increase is not rhetoric. I've explained the effect we want. The issue about the drivers, I'm very unhappy like you are. We've met our colleagues from Congo several times at the highest level. The problem is on the other side. It's not on our side. This is why we're working hard to rebuild relationships with our neighbors so that we can show our neighbors that by not managing the border, by closing the border at 15 hours that side, when we've agreed that the border will be closing, no, that will be, the border will be open 24-7. I think that's the latest agreement. Minister of Commerce, are you here? There he is. He signed an understanding with his fellow colleagues that side that the border will be open 24-7, meaning every hour. But the border there, they close at what time? They only run for four or five hours. Now, am I supposed to now enter Congo and start uh, shooting at people? Is that what I'm supposed to do? No, I'm supposed to continue doing what is right within diplomatic channels. We've raised this issue to the SADC level, Commerce Minister. The SADC ministers are dealing with this matter because it's not just Zambian trucks and drivers. It's trucks and drivers from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from everywhere, Tanzania, Tanzania through the, that route, they're using every, it's a problem, I admit but we will not solve it by conflict. We will solve it, Frank, by you're a diplomat, isn't it? More economic diplomat. To show our friends that even them are losing. One driver died holding his steering wheel on the queue. No one can be happy with that. But we're doing our best, colleagues. It's a matter beyond our control. If we were the only ones, would have done it. You know when we're faced with issues here, we move quickly and deal with those issues. But now it's a bilateral issue, it's a SADC issue, it's an African Union issue. You'll be pleased that in the last meeting of what is called Smart Africa, I have proposed a non-stop border post. Y your own government here, your own president, stood in front of other presidents to say, one-stop border post is not even good enough because technology, Frank, allows us to see what is being loaded in Beira while you are seated here and the truck is moving. We know the content. If someone changes the content, technology will tell us that the truck stops somewhere and they put human beings instead of uh, salt. So therefore, we should have a non-stop border post. You will be pleased to know that the smart Africa 
chaired by President Kagame of Rwanda, have now adopted the Zambia suggestion that non-stop border post is what we need, not one-stop border post. And we're working on it, and investments are going in that. And that should now bind other countries, because Smart Africa involves not just Zambia, but other. So I wanted to explain this, that we feel for the drivers, we feel for businesses that are suffering. It will help us bottom up our economy if goods can move quickly. But we have to come around in a peaceful manner, strong manner, but peaceful manner, to talk to our neighbors. Even this issue of neighbors entering our country directly by maize from uh, the fields, it's illegal. There are national boundaries. We've asked our neighbors who are short of food to say, place an order on us formally. Place an order and we negotiate. Then we go to our farmers, please produce more and you can supply meal meal to this order in Congo, in Tanzania. Minister of Commerce, you want to confirm that now Congo has given us an order. Following this request, at the highest level and the minister's level, Congo has now given us a formal order of what they require. And we want to trade formally without chasing people in the bush. Progress again. That's not rhetoric. That's real. Real. But we also want the money to be paid into our banking system so that the dollars come into our economy and not paid into offshore centers and we don't have the dollars frank coming back into our economy. Yet we spend dollars to buy the fertilizer. This is what I mean. And that's what's creating distortions on the foreign exchange market. So we are now invoking the banks and our friends across to say, deposit money in our banking system in exchange for millimil at a price which is agreed. I will, I will not encourage the minister to say the price. The price is good. We've been able to negotiate a fantastic price. Give us credit. Don't give us credit. We'll continue working. Because that's our duty. I think I'm done on this one. Um, I'm not sure if it's anything I've left here, but I think we've covered it. Uh, on the mines, I've covered it. That the complications have been huge. Legal issues have taken a bit longer than we expected. It's not rhetoric. If there's a government that will unravel this, it's the UPND government. Because the other government took us there took us into the problem on the mines. That's part of the reduction in production there. You will see mines went down. Thank you. Uh-huh. So much interest. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, for those irrelevant answers. Ish, so many hands, eh? Um, now, oh, men. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, Prime TV, okay. I'm, I'm told now there is a mobile microphone somewhere. Um, okay, uh, you can come for yourself here. For, um, our elder statesman Frank, you will be next. Um, maybe you can have he can have the the mobile microphone, but we will start with the Prime TV here. Then we Frank, and uh, I can see Diamond. Um, yeah. For now, these three, then we will see how we move. But please, let's be a bit brief in our questions. We are not here also to start addressing the, the nation. <laughs> so to say, let's be brief in our questions uh, so that we can we see how we can cover a uh, good ground. And also, if you know, if you have heard your friend has asked something similar, try and see if you can just drop your hand and uh, move on, then come to ask the same stuff. Thank you, Colonel. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good afternoon. My name is Oswald Kafuanka from Prime TV. Um, among the issues uh, raised by uh, the opposition and some of your critics are issues to do with building homegrown economic solutions for uh, the debt management program. Is government considering uh, building homegrown solutions for the debt management besides the IMF? Cause program has been dragging for some time. Thank you. Morning, Mr. President. Morning. And welcome back 
thank from you. your Champions League trips. Thank you. And thank you for this press conference, Mr. President. But I, I would suggest that uh, to complement this, maybe in future we have more one-on-one -on -one, you know, interviews. Mr. President, there's no doubt you know, that you are adored abroad because of the aggressive way you're marketing you know, this country. But at home, even with the many successes that you have tabulated, there is growing discontent among some of the electorate and the citizens. How do you explain this? And related to that, recently you lamented that some of the ministries were underperforming. What decisive action are you taking? And being a senior journalist, a very quick one, this is important, Mr. President. Recently, you advised your you, predecessor. You are, you are breaking the rules of the engagement. As a senior citizen, and <laughs> since the moderator is a since you have yeah. been a, you have abused me, sir, and I can <laughs> abuse you, sir. Yeah, I, I take that one. Thank you, sir, <laughs> Mr. President. Recently, you advised your predecessor to retire from politics. How significant is this? What would be the impact on the country's governance? And what is your reaction to those calling for a reconciliation mean meeting? Meanwhile, the former Faith family are complaining that they're being harassed. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think it's diamond. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, afternoon. My, name, my name is Darius um, Jonia from Diamond TV. Um, Mr. President, I just wanted to get your um, official stance on the cultivation as well as usage of uh, hemp and medical cannabis um, in Zambia. Um, are we able to expect the implementation of related policies before 2026? And uh, also, furthermore, further on this um, same issue, Mr. President. Moderator, please manage the situation. One question. Only it's, the it's senior citizen. Mm. Please, please, politely. Eh? That's your role. Yeah. Darius, maybe we can, we can stick your, your question to him. It's, it's a, it's a follow-up on the same question. <laughs> yeah, because it would be unfair to Funga. Yeah. Yeah. We would be unfair to her. Yeah, I think exactly. the rules yeah. must apply, other than Frank. It's only fair. Please do your bit. Eh? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, your message is taken on your first question. Okay. So I think we have the three from Prime. Well, Frank, obviously, I was expecting that. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Could I suggest to my colleagues, generous, your your moderator is a bit. Uh, just choose the, the most important question. The idea of doing this is to allow more people to come in. It's not really to restrict you, just to allow more people to come in, more diversity, please, please, please. Every arrangement has rules. Uh, that's really what you should be doing, my friend, not me. Um, Frank is special, he knows that he's special. He always knows. Um, Oswat, homegrown solutions to debt management. Here, because you particularly say the opposition are saying that, I think I ended my press briefing by asking the opposition to give alternatives, yeah. viable alternatives. That's my answer to your question. Homegrown solutions to debt. I don't know what that means. Because if you owe someone money, you have to pay. You have to restructure. That's why we defaulted. In 2020, we defaulted because those asking for homegrown solutions had no homegrown solutions. They defaulted. This government has not defaulted. This government came in straight, also what? To negotiate what we call debt service sustainability initiative upon taking office. This is what I called earlier on. We were filling the ground 
to say how deep is this hole. Once we realized how deep it, the hole was, we went into a management program, an organized program, to ensure that debt default, which is a damaging thing to your credit rest rating, part of the cost of money we are paying now, I didn't say that, arises from debt default, the way you are profiled by creditors. So I'm not sure which opposition is talking of homegrown. Let them define what they mean. Then we can answer. If the homegrown is about growing the economy, that's what we're doing. Because is paying your debt or restructuring your debt is only one side of the equation. The other side is to grow your economy so that this proportion of the debt to the size of the economy gets smaller. But in this case, there was no solution to a debt other than borrowing more and more. On the flip side, the economy was declining. Dangerous business, extremely dangerous business. And we don't want to go in that direction. Honestly speaking, fellow citizens, I ask you to pay attention to where your country is coming from and how it got there and how to take it out of that situation. I, I ask you to pay attention. If you are lost in the noise, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, and anything that is said in the social media is true. That's why I advised again, criticism is okay, positive or negative, as long as it's done factually, respectively, and maturely, professionally. But to make allegations or assertions that there's a homegrown solution, which did not work and worsen the situation, until we came into office and now we are stabilizing the country, the figures are there. The pain is there, of course. I, I alluded to it, isn't it? The restructuring process creates pain. If you remember, when the late Manawasa came in, part of the pain was that for three, four years, there were no salary increments for public sector workers. And he made it very clear that if you want to come out of the debt trap, he picked then, public servants were not going to get a pay sal salary increment for two, three years. It was part of the pain. But we've taken a different approach where we, are, we realize that people have been in pain for 10 years plus, as you can see there. That's why we talked about those amelioration measures. You are also aware public sector workers are getting salary increments above inflation, actually, almost is close to or above inflation. Because we recognize that Zambians have been in pain for a long time. But they still have to accept that things will only be better when we've gotten the economy going. I make this request to citizens seriously. That's where we lose it. Honestly speaking, we lose it as a nation. That's why we've been doing this. We lose it. The cat that catches the mouse is what you want. You may not like it. It may not be sociable enough to appease you with dancing. <laughs> but that's what you want. If you want your children to be in school, if you want jobs to be created, that's the card you want. And that's your UPND. You chose it. You elected it to do just that. And we're grateful for that. And we will not let you down. That's our message. We will work so hard, even harder than what we're doing. Somebody in Paris asked me a question. He said, HH, we saw you yesterday in the afternoon at a meeting in Scotland. But in the same day, we saw you in the morning at a meeting in London, in England. This morning at 9, you are in a meeting in Paris with President Macron. How is that possible? I said, well, work has to be done. And I think Zambians, let us work, my dear fellow citizen. Nothing short of working and working hard and working smart will change your country. I want to appeal to you that we must join hands in changing the course of the country. It's all there. Today I did the press conference different. It's all there. It's here. 
anything short of that it becomes a desire which is not matched by reality. So that would be my answer. But we are open to advice. If colleagues in the opposition say, okay, look, we sank you into debt as a country. Now we have realized we made a mistake. We think this is a solution. We are happy to look at it. But that must come with credibility also, because the lenders will say, you guys are not credible anyway. You defaulted. Again, Zambians must see that as an indictment, a very serious indictment on ourselves and how we do things. But we're happy to take advice. I said it already. I'll go to Darius before I go to a senior citizen. Cultivation of medicinal marijuana. I think that's taking its course. I believe you are raising that in connection to the growth of the economy, to create business opportunities, sales. Um, I do believe that that's taking its course. I must honestly say to you, I have not got an update on that. I don't want to give you wrong information, but we'll follow it up, uh, Darius, and we'll come back to you. And maybe through you, since you're a journalist, you can provide that answer to the public through your media. So that will be my answer to that. But I know the legislative issues, I know the operation issues, but I'm not competent now to raise that matter definitively. So you can forgive me for that, but we'll come back to you. Vamu Tuvila. Growing discontent at home. Um, I take note of what you say. But in a way, I've touched it already, that there is a process, there's some pain as you reconstruct the economy, Frank. At least you are old enough to know what happened towards the late, no, in the late 80s. You know what happened. Younger people may not know that story. It sits in there. You can look at that graph. The pain was there. And when change took place in 1991, again, numbers don't lie. Just check that, Frank. You see that that pain continued from 1991 election, when Zambians decided it's time to move to another team of public sector managers. 19 is all was exacerbated 19, after 1986 elections, Frank, 19, no, 1988, I'm wrong, my apologies. 1988, two years later, there was a food riot there. Then the elections were brought forward by three years. Instead of elections happening in by two years, I think, 1993 or so, 1991. But after the change for President Chiluba, may he so rest in peace, who now brought in different policies to address the failure of the government of 27 years. Younger people don't know that. And that's where we have sometimes a bit of responsibility to teach the young people how bad we were and why we should not allow ourselves to go back there. And we did allow ourselves to go back there in a few years. It's not right. So you see, Frank, 1991 elections take place. You're checking on that shit, right? The problems of restructuring the economy linger on and 1994, we went down by growth dramatically. But President Chiluva had already started planting the seed, digging the foundation. You heard me talk about digging the foundation here. Four years later, from 1991, three years later, the fruit was not yet ripe. And we dipped down and started again. It takes a bit of time. So that's my answer to your question. It's Zambians to understand that graph that we're on the right path. Any reversal to what we're doing will damage us as a nation. And I think that is what I would say around the discontent. The discontent is a buildup of the damage that was done 10 years earlier. And we are healing that damage. As it happened to President Chiluba, may so rest in peace. We take President Chiluba for granted, he's gone. But today, you have no queues for, mini, for buses. 
but it took up to 1994, 1995 to see that fruit. But today, Zambians want to see the fruit in one year, eight months. But the seed is there. That's what I would say. And not to disturb you, Frank, if you check 1998, we were not yet there. There was another dip there. This was President Chiluba's second term. Into the second term, the dip came. We're working hard to avoid that dip. That's exactly the message I'm giving today. That's a message. And we're moving very fast. So we hope that Zambians can understand. But also, Frank, if a citizen, a house had two children in school, and they were paying school fees, now they're not paying. It means they've saved money. It's as simple as that. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. If they didn't have any social cash transfer, now they have social cash transfer. If they're not on it, Minister Mwamba should make sure they're on it. You know anybody you seated here who is not on social cash transfer, but qualifies, raise the bell. Raise the bell. Raise the alarm. That's my call. That's why we talked about 20% NAPSA, Frank, to inject cash in the economy and allow people to invest. All these measures are well thought through, methodically. So that's my answer, my dear senior citizen, on that one. You tagged another question, the only one allowed to do that. Underperforming ministers, ministries. I think you have noticed some changes we're making. I actually said maybe not to the satisfaction of everybody, but we are also a fair leadership. When you come from depression like that, you know that the civil service itself got affected over the years in underperformance. But we have changed as many as possible. We will continue to do that. That's why we have put a program like PP. D, F, P, D, U, to assist those that are willing to change. Frank, those that are not willing to change, I'm afraid we have to part ways because our interest is service to the people of Zambia who elected us into office. That would be my comment. But I also encourage citizens, you know something that we don't know, let us know. Tip someone. Tip someone. Third question, Frank, you raised was about retirement. That was purely a legal issue. Purely a legal issue. I started with myself that when I've done my time, I will retire and go and look after gods. The gods are waiting for me. They need my attention, and I love them so much, and I think they love me, <laughs> because you can see how they multiply when we give them more time and attention. On a more serious note, it's a legal issue. You cannot be in retirement, and yet you're in politics. The law does not allow that. At the beginning, Frank, we talked about restoring the rule of law, isn't it? This is part of the rule of law. So who is offending who now? HH is not offending any individual or targeting anybody. It is the law that is being offended. You cannot be in politics, yet you are retired and you are re receiving retirement benefits, which is anchored on the law that says you must retire. I hope I'm making myself clear here. Let me extend the answer to your dry but loaded question. Eh? The law is clear. When the president, former president retires, they must not stay in politics, and the emoluments they get are based on the law, and they are provided for in the law. Today I see a headline in one of the newspapers to say, no, HH lied. It wasn't 13 policemen, it was eight. Okay, I asked the secretary of the cabinet, is he, is there? I said, please, can you deal with that? Me, I'm given information to interpret the law. The law is clear. 
But in this case, if there was misinformation, it's the cabinet office. Is that my problem? It's the cabinet office. So what we've agreed with the Secretary of the Cabinet, he will clarify today that statement. What does the law say? How many policemen were there? But what I know that even eight is offending the law. Even four is offending the law. Because the number is three. So now you can see the malice in there. What's the malice that HH lied, uh, honestly speaking? Hmm. You can see how we have reduced things. The substance of the matter is not 13 or 8. The substance of the matter is that has the law been offended? The law has been offended. It's not HH, Frank, because you are a good man. On that day, I was not around when that halabu happened. And in the morning, the insults were going at HH. Insults by colleagues that have been in politics for a long time. And I just smiled, never answered, never answered. In the afternoon, the charge was laid, a complaint from a citizen. A citizen who is infringed, the law, Bill of Rights, a citizen who is infringed in this country called Zambia, territory, has a right to complain, and their complaint must be heard. That's in the Bill of Rights. Minister, am I right? And the authorities, be it the court or so, don't have a choice. The word is obligation. Am I right, Minister? I may miss the exact word, but it's obligation, Frank, to act. That's the rule of law. But why were the insults directed at HH? Am I the one who complained? Am I one, the one who received $400? I don't know. <laughs> to do that, end to end. But the insults were loaded to me, and the social media was very excited. The charge was laid. It had nothing to do with it. Any minister, the president, it had to do with the law, based on what the law says. So you can see. So, and to claim that HH is harassing a family is not true, Frank. You know sometimes, citizens, we must be fair to each other. Sometimes. Sometimes we must analyze things in a fair and objective manner. Between the two of us, who harassed who? Let's be direct now. Between my colleague ECL and HH, who is who harassed who? Who is harassing who? Peacefully is living there. The policemen are there. When there was a robbery there, it was found out the people who robbed him were his own cadres. Who discovered that? It is the police, the very police. I was not allowed to use Chipata Airport, Frank. I even asked, I was on the runway for three, four hours there during campaign time, official campaign time. My colleague instructed that I must not be allowed to use airports. How do I know? The footage is there. It's there. But citizens choose to ignore all of that and start pretending that HH is harassing the former president. I have no intention to do that, Frank. I was never brought up like that. My brain doesn't work like that. Maybe what people are having difficulty is to accept that I'm not harassing anybody who harassed me. I think that's where the problem is. But get used to that, that my brain works differently. I should have been dead a long time ago. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. It's there. Ngani kumbi ulia limbi nilisha alifwa. Alifwa ulia nilisha alifwa ngani kumbi. Nga haka weshepo nga muka kanomba taka fume. Haka fuila mukati. By word of mouth. 
So now, citizens, can we be fair with each other? If he was being harassed, would he be joking on the roads, public roads? If I joked Frank like that, I went on a road line in 2011, July 2011, I was a dead man. You all know that. But we brought the rule of law, protecting everybody. You talk of pangas. Since we took office, have you ever seen any pangas in the streets being sharpened? In the streets, qua, qua, qua. <laughs> Can we be fair as citizens and call things by their right names? My brother is free. If anyone is tampering with his freedom, I'm the first one to step in to protect him. I'm the first one. I will be the first one. All we are doing is to follow the law. Frank, when I leave office, I don't want the taxpayer to pay me money and I'm still in politics. I'm still running UPND. The matter is in court and the court is bringing these issues out, not me. They're arguing on their own there. So how do I become the problem now? I'm, we are the solution. Frank, let me tell you why I did what I did, and for the people of Zambia. Once we were declared winners, on the 16th, I, I guess I'm right, 16th of August. I think it was 16th of August, 15 or 16th of August. I knew, Frank, that if I did not provide leadership, there would be deaths and killings in the compounds and in the villages. Because the way our colleagues treated us, killing people, maiming people, Kamu got there, bullets missing us, taking Lawrence Banda and leaving his young children and wife, taking Joseph Kaunda, taking Saman Sama, bullets. If I did not do what I did on that day, Frank, at the community house, and said nobody will revenge, nobody will avenge, nobody will wage war against a fellow citizen, citizens will have died. And this country today would have been a different country. You wouldn't recognize it. And I knew the blood would be on my head. I would never allow that. Even against those who would have wanted me dead, I don't wish my colleague anything. Frank, I'm available to talk. Talking is the answer. Um, I've always been available. I don't want to review many things here because I'm responsible. My colleague and I talk. Be known to you. But what is said in public is a different matter. So how do I deal with such a situation? Someone is not telling the truth there. There are crimes that were committed before and conversations took place how to treat those issues within the law. I advise, let's treat this thing within the law. But citizens are not aware. But someone goes on a platform and says, there is no communication. Now, the day I review, if it's necessary, you'll be shocked. <laughs> we must repent. Sometimes we must repent so that society becomes normal. I think the danger and the pain that is there, that there is no abnormality, there are no commanders, there are no bangers, there are no guns. That is making some people miss access to cash, illegal cash. I can tell you that I'll put my foot down. That will not be allowed. I think we may close this press conference. We have, we have said enough. Thank you, uh, our colleagues in the media. I know there are still a number of hands out there, but please, I know we can go on and on. Um, we have covered enough ground so far. Uh, I can assure you that if you have anything pressing, please send it over to our office. We will certainly uh, get back to you and give you a reply or uh, refer you to a, a relevant, relevant ministry. So for now, we will stand up and sing the national anthem as we close this press conference. Thank you.
Stand and sing of Zambia, proud and free. Land of work and joy in unity. Victors in the struggle for their right. We won freedom's fight. Oh, one strong and free. Africa is our own motherland. Fashioned with and blessed by God's good hands. Let us all have people join as one. Brothers under the sun. Oh, one strong and free. One land and one nation is our cry. Dignity and peace need Zambia sky. Like a noble eagle in its flight. Zambia, praise to thee. Oh, one strong and free. Praise be to God. Praise be, praise be, praise be. Bless our great nation. Zambia, Zambia. Free men we stand under the flag of our land. Zambia, praise to Okay, thanks. This is where we end. Uh, but Mr. President, we are getting a number of requests from our media colleagues. They are requesting for a, a, a group photo no with you by the CIA. With so pleasure. Please, I think we can um, go over yeah. there for the okay. group photo. Thank you. Just the media? Yeah, just the media, sir. Anyone else? You <laughs> Well, that is uh, what uh, is presented when it comes to this particular uh, press briefing with the president touching on a number of issues. Well, uh, it's fair to say that uh, the uh, thrust of this uh, uh, you know, press briefing was around the economy. And um, the president has assured the country that um, he remains committed together with his government um, in ensuring that uh, he transforms the economic fortunes of this particular country. Um, he touched on the issue of mining, obviously, which was uh, on the lips of many uh, who were giving expectations with regards to what the president would touch on. 
and it says, of course, there are some challenges that uh, you know government is facing uh, in as far as resolving some of those uh, you know challenges that the sector is facing. But he has assured the country that um, uh, everything is on course when it comes to that. The issue of debt as well um, did uh, you know characterize this press briefing by the president, and he again has said, look, we are on course, um, and he did cite uh, you know um, his recent meeting with the president of France, um, uh, President uh, Macron, and he mentioned that they had a very lengthy and progressive discussion. Um, and that is one of uh, you know the uh, points of evidence that indeed uh, the president is uh, uh, doing what he can to ensure that this country um, does uh, you know score success um, in terms of the debt restructuring. And you know that that is very important uh, because the debt burden has been a very huge challenge uh, for the country um, in terms of attaining economic development. But the president said um, uh, and has assured once again the country that everything is on course and as far as uh, that uh, is uh, concerned. He did uh, you know run us through the economic. Um, you know, history of this country, if you like. And um, he mentioned that there were some mistakes that were made in the past. And uh, he says the New Dawn government um, is, uh, you know, determined to ensure that uh, those mistakes don't come to the fore again. Um, and that sounds like a new Zambia for you uh, going forward as far as the economy is concerned. The press has so many issues, so many questions. You can't imagine the number of hands that were up, you know, um, uh, hoping to uh, get the attention of the president. But these questions, I want to believe, will continue to be, uh, you know, thrown at the president and he will be responding uh, in the background. So thank you very much for watching. My name is Brian Mulamba. We're coming to you live uh, from State House. On behalf of everybody who was involved in this production, stay on ZNBC TV One. Bye-bye.